Today we have here Joanna Rothman from uh, the United States. She um, has been brought to, uh, to Europe by Topic to uh, have a few uh, speeches here. Joanna is um, leads, I should say. Um, how is it called? The Rothman... Rothman Consulting Consultancy. Group, Inc. Consultancy Group, right. Inc. And this is a group that um, has a broad range of activities based on uh, managing firms, departments, and technology workers. So it's, it's targeted at managing the technology field. Mm -hmm. um, Joanna has a uh, broad range of activities from uh, giving speeches to uh, writing books. Um, I won't say too much. I leave uh, the stage to her because I think she needs her time. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for having me. I am assuming that you can all hear me? Yes? Okay, I guess if you couldn't hear me, what are you going to do? Say no? All right, so let's see if we can get started. One of the things I have found, thank you very much, I have to somehow sometimes thank my remote. It normally works, but every so often I wonder. Um, I, have, I have found that as a developer, uh, sometimes it's difficult to know exactly what the priorities are and exactly what work to do when. You're sitting there, you're trying to get some stuff done, and your manager comes to you and says, I need a good name. Okay, Edwin, since I know you and you're in the front row, I can use you. Edwin, it's time to do also this project. And Edwin says, well... Okay, I can see, I have a few holes in my schedule. I might have to wait for someone to do something over here. I can probably squeeze it in. Notice the squeeze it in, right? This is not a full-fledged, yes, I can commit. This is a squeeze it in. And if Edwin has managers the way I've had managers in the past, and a week or so later, they come back to him and say, Edwin, we would really like you to do another project. And by this time, Edwin is saying, uh, I have two hands, I have two projects, I might be able to juggle two, I'm not exactly sure how to juggle three. But maybe Edwin doesn't exactly know how to say no yet, and so he says, uh, I'll see what I can do, which is a not full, firm commitment to yes. And then what happens is someone else comes with a really important problem that needs to be fixed. You, there are actually seats in the front if you'd like to sit in the front. It's okay. Um, and so maybe there's a very um, a crucial fix for a very important customer. And who can do it? Edwin. In fact, he's the only one who can do it. And now what happens? He's juggling two, three, four, five projects, and is he making any progress? No. He's not making progress at all. And so this is what happens when you have a ton of stuff to do. You're multitasking. You don't necessarily want to be multitasking, but maybe it's hard to say no. Maybe it's hard actually to say yes. And, and even if you could say no, what is it that you're not going to do? So we have a whole bunch of decisions that we want to be able to think about making. There are a bunch of problems with multitasking, and I suspect since most of you are developers, you are well aware of these problems. That first of all, it's very costly to multitask, because the time that you need to context switch turns out to be the more projects you have, the more time you spend context switching. So you just waste tons of time in your day. Um, it can be very confusing. I know once I was working on one project, and, and especially if you work in an organization where you have a several related projects, they're not the same, but maybe they use um, some of the same base code for the platform, or maybe they work some of the same way with the GUI. You start looking at some of this stuff and you say, oh, I know what to do, and you go and do it, and it's in the wrong project. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It actually happened to me. So, you know, I, I'm, when I was 25 or 26, I certainly was not in danger of having Alzheimer's. But my boss came to me and said, possible to predict when you're going to be done, right? That's the worst part, is you start working on one project, you think you know when you're going to be done, you have absolutely no idea when you're going to be done. So the reason the costs of multitasking are so high is because we have to act like computers, except we're people. And there's this problem, we don't make very good we don't make very good computers. So we have to have all that stuff that's in our short-term memory, swap it out as soon as we get um, interrupted, 
And sometimes the cost of just an interruption is actually very high. If you're just reading a book or you're reading something that you don't have to remember and you can go back to, you put a bookmark in the place, you, you somehow note where you are, it's not a big problem. But if you're reading code that's not very well written, that, I, I, I know, you don't have any of that here. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Other places have that problem. Uh, but if, you, if you're reading code that's not well written, or you're reading a spec that's not well written, and you might have been making sort of notes in your head, but you haven't made them on paper yet, and then you get interrupted and you have to stop this work, you have a whole bunch of stuff in your short-term memory that even the youngest of you are not going to remember for very long. Never mind those of us with plenty of gray hair. So the stopping your current work, the swapping out of that current work, right? Computers swap out exact copies of what's in memory to disk. Uh, I don't think I've ever done that. Um, maybe some of you have, but it's very, very hard to remember everything and be able to regenerate it later. And then bringing in the new work, that's swapping in. So there's all kinds of costs associ associated with multitasking that's just hard for people to realize when they ask developers to do new projects or anyone else to, to add additional projects. And so I would like to try a couple of, I have four little projects laid out over here. I need four volunteers to do four little projects and I guarantee you I will only have you spend less than four minutes doing projects. And since the nice people in the front row sat down early, I'm not going to ask them. Um, so can I have four volunteers, please? So the idea here is I'm trying to simulate a small software project, right? And there are, there are origami projects of different difficulty. And we'll see what happens as they get closer to finishing or not finishing one of the projects. I normally have to narrate during this part. It's kind of weird, right? Let's watch people do projects. So let me see how they're going. I'm, I'll, I won't interrupt them. I'll just observe how they're going. So we have, we have someone who's working on step, what, three or four? Oh, we're back to step one. I said some of them were challenging. Oh, we have, I think we're on step four, step three, okay. And it's a total of eight steps, if I can count. And how are we doing on the house, the gentleman in the blue shirt? Uh, step four out of, out of six. These are, now I gotta tell you, when I started figuring out how to use origami in my workshops and my talks, I of course asked my younger daughter, who at the time was nine or 10, to do this with me. She's whipping out this stuff, right? And I am trying to follow the directions, not able to do anything for much longer. Okay, are, are you stuck, sir? <laughs> a bit? Okay, why don't you put that down and help him? Okay, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> have, I, have I done this multitasking thing? I am looking like the manager from you know what right now. But, and I still, haven't, I still haven't bugged the guy in the end. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> Step 11 out of, out, out of 12. Oh, he's very close. Okay, put it down. Come on over here. Come on over here and help him. All right, now, how obnoxious was that? Step 11 out of 12. Now, we all know about the 90% done schedule game, right? But he actually was very close to finishing. Okay, one more minute and then I'm gonna. Okay, now I'm gonna be truly obnoxious and I'm gonna ask you to go back there. That was really helpful, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, and now what did I do? So I took him off of his current project. I had him go back to his other project, but he's had a chance to, to change context. Now, this is a really small project that's not that hard to do, right? So the changing of context might not be so bad. I think he's going to get it. This is good. Did you get it? Oh, fabulous. Oh. All right. Thank you all very much. If you, if you would like to do this later, that's fine. Oh, did you get the boat? Did you get the Oh, and we have another one. Thank you very, very much for participating. You, you very much helped me. So let me ask. So I did a little narration as we went. 
what did you, I mean, if you, if you guys want to talk about what it was like to, to be interrupted or to have help inflicted on you, um, did anyone want to talk about some of that? Oh, has anyone else had help inflicted on them? It's, it can be very distressing, right? And I, I actually managed to make it take longer. So the gentleman who was doing the lantern, the one with the, the red origami at the end, he was almost done. And I took him off that project and had him go to another project. And I bet that kind of thing actually happens to you more often than you would like. So one of the things that's really important is to understand how to say yes to more work, right? Now it's, it's a very simple word, certainly in English, and I believe it's a fairly simple word in Dutch. Yeah, yeah. okay. So it's not that hard to say. But the problem is, is if you never actually say yes to something, if you never really commit to it, it there's, um, I think in almost any sport, there's a time when you have to commit your weight to the other foot. I don't know anything about football, what I would call soccer, right, because I just don't know anything about it. But almost any, any sport you do if you're on land, you have to actually commit to something and take your weight off the other leg, right? If you're running, you have to do that. So the, the idea of yes is that you commit, and you make a strong commitment, and you actually say, yes, we can do it. Now, the interesting thing about yes is that if you say yes to everything, you can really get in trouble. Because if you always say yes, then you're never actually committing to something. You do this yes thing where I sometimes say yes and then I go back and say, you know, I have to go back and work on that other thing, which is maybe fine for dancing, right, if I want to dance on the stage, but it's not fine for working. And that's the real issue, that if you don't have the time or the energy or the ability to commit to this work, you can be really in trouble if you actually say yes. Um, and especially if someone comes to you, I, I had a manager who I swear waited until I walked out of my office and would try and get me to commit to stuff in the hall. So I'd be walking to the, down the hall to a meeting or to work with someone else with my stuff, right? And I would always be thinking, so of course I had my head down thinking when walking like this. And he would say, JR, and I'd say, what? And he'd say, I got another project for you. And at one point, okay, this is the non-career enhancing conversation. <laughs> I actually said, so what? You're not supposed to say that to your boss, especially when your boss is a VP. So it's, I'm not saying that you should say, so what? But I am saying that you want to understand what a yes really means. So let me tell you a little story about a developer I know. Senior developer, architect level guy, very, very bright, is able to actually handle lots of different kinds of projects for his organization. And I suspect that probably defines a number of you folks in here, that you, in effect, you have services that you provide to a number of different projects. And what he did was he said, okay, I know that all of these projects really need me. He got hung up on the really need me part. And so I will commit to, to giving as much as I can to all of these projects. But there was one project that was strategically important for the company. And this particular project was about making the performance of this product much, much faster. Something like uh, 40 to 50 percent improvement in, in performance. This is not something you get off the spur of the moment unless you just get incredibly lucky. This is something you have to work, you have to instrument the code, you have to instrument the product, you have to take the instrumentation out to make sure that your changes actually do something. I mean, this is really hard work. And so he had this project as his main project. And then he would projects because it was just a day here, which was never a day, closer to a few weeks. Just a day there, just a day here, just a day there. And he gets into work one Monday morning, realizing that he is supposed to have finished his performance work by the end of the week. And he has not yet started it. Now, he felt terrible. He told the project manager, explained what was going on, and did a reevaluation of all of his work. Um, he didn't get fired for that, but it, I think it really changed the way he started thinking about his work. So it, if you always say yes to something, you're actually not committing to anything at all. And then there's the problem of no. Now, sometimes in some organizations, no is a non-career enhancing conversation. 
right? If your boss comes to you and says, can you do this thing? And you say, no, you might not be out the door literally, but your boss is noticing that you've said no, and this is not something your boss wants. So it's really important to understand how you can say no. Uh, I, I will tell you a couple stories about me, since I am really good at not saying no. I mean, I'm good at saying no, but I'm not good at saying it in a very good way. I already told you about the so what. Um, I was also a developer many years ago, and my boss came to me and said, we have a bunch of little projects that I'd like you to work on. None of them should take more than two weeks. Okay, never believe your boss. Sorry, right, I, there's a boss in the front row, sorry. Uh, those of you who are bosses, you can't possibly know what it takes anymore. But, he, okay, I actually believed him. And he started saying, so I want you to do this and then do that, and let me know how you're progressing as we go through. So I started on the first project, and at week four, <laughs> I realized I'm in trouble, right? Because I now have spent four weeks on this supposedly two-week project. And my boss comes to me and says, so, how's it going? Making progress on everything? And I said, no, I'm not making progress on anything. In fact, I'm going to give you back these other five projects. You can give them to someone else. I would really like to do that one. But I'm not going to get to it because I, I still have some investigation work to do to figure out how long this particular project is going to take. And he, said, he actually said these words to me. He said, you can't say no to me. And I said, what is this, slavery? OK. <laughs> do not go there. That is not the way to say no. But it's useful to have other tools in your arsenal about how to say no. And we're going to talk about those. Now, the really dangerous one is maybe. <coughs> and why is maybe dangerous? How, how do you say maybe in Dutch? It sounds kind of wishy, doesn't it? OK. Um, the problem with maybe is that the people who want to hear yes, hear yes. And those are all your managers. And the people who want to hear no will hear no. And those are your team members, right? The people who work around you who might have st stuff to, for you to either work, who either need to give you handoffs or you owe them handoffs. So when you say maybe, you have managed to anger. There's a much better colloquialism, but you can imagine what that is. You have managed to anger every single person that you know, that you work with. So maybe is really bad. You're much better at saying either yes or no. Maybe is, is truly awful. So I wanted to practice saying a few words. And since we're kind of full, I might not have you walk around, but I might have you turn around. So I'd like everyone to stand up. And uh, I guess, you know, I don't know what that means for the guy in the back making the, the pictures. You might have to pick up the camera. So, because you guys are tall here. I, you know, what you'd have to do, import the shortest person in the US? OK, so everyone stand up. All right, everyone say yes. yes. OK, with fervor. Yes. yes. Oh, that was fabulous. OK, now say no. No. Say it even louder with more fervor. No. no. Oh, that was very good. Now, instead of having you walk around and talk to everyone in the room, because it's just not that big, I'd like you to sort of turn around where you are, talk to people on the side, talk to people in back of you, in front of you, and start saying yes to them. Just say yes for me. <laughs> OK. OK, that was good. It's clear I'm going to have to take out my little dinger, because you guys are good at saying yes. All right, how about no? Say no to a few people. OK, so OK, now it's your choice. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to give you maybe as a choice. I was going to give you yes or no as a choice. Choose whether or not to say yes or no. OK, thank you very much. You, it's, a, it's safe to sit down. Those of you in the back will still be able to see me. So what was it like? What was it like to say yes? It's a nice feeling to say yes, right? 
No? No? It wasn't a nice feeling to say yes? We might have some cynics in the front row. Well, oh, definitely. Okay. We, what was it like to say no? You know, I ask this question and people always laugh. There's something about saying no with no context that sort of kind of feels funny sometimes. How about when you got to choose? What did you choose to say, yes or no? Did you choose both? Yeah, how did it feel to say yes when you chose? Still, still felt good. How about when you said no when you chose? And so that felt good too. One of, the, one of the things I see when I run this, when I do this simulation in workshops, there are people who say no, <laughs> smiling, shaking their heads no. When with the smile, you would expect them to be saying yes, but they're um, or they say no, sorry, sorry, no. And then you sort of wonder, you know, it, do they have to apologize for saying no? We we say no for perfectly good reasons. So I know that you all know how to say yes and say no, but the question is, how do you do it? And I think one of the things is that you have to think about multiple ways to communicate. You want to be able to have a conversation with your manager, with your fellow developers, with your testers, with whomever, and have a conversation in multiple ways so that you can get the idea of why it is you want to say no across. I like to really show what's going on, and I like to be able to think about ways to negotiate for a different time to deliver this thing. And I really want to use words other than just yes or no. So let me talk, excuse me, a little bit about project portfolios. Is everyone here familiar with the concept of a product backlog, where you have a list of, of features or requirements that you're going to get to, and with any luck, they're in ranked order. In ranked order means it's really your product backlog. Excuse me. A project portfolio is one of those things that ha that you can use as uh, you can use as a backlog for yourself. I'm going to show you a picture that's going to be hard to see because I thought you'd have handouts, uh, but I will make sure that you have a PDF. So you can't. This is just too hard to see. I realize. On the left hand side, this is what your manager should have. On the left-hand side are the people down the side, so you can see Tina and Terry and Tristan and Isabel and Irene and all those people, and then the manager on the bottom. And then week by week, for no more than four weeks, which feature or and which project these people are going to work on. You can do the same thing for yourself. You can say, you can just, because you just have one person across, but you can say, week one, what am I going to work on? And if you have more than one thing, on that line, then you, want, you know that you're multitasking and you know that's going to be a problem. Now, there are times when you have to be able to multitask, right? So if, if a very important customer calls with a really urgent problem and you are the one who can fix it and you are the only one, then you are going to put your work on hold because the cost of not fixing that problem could be extremely high. You want to fix that problem. But then you recognize that what you're doing is multitasking. The, and, and what's interesting is if you're working at an architecture or design level on the, other, on the project that you're going to put aside, and now you have to work on the debugging level, there's multitasking at levels for work, especially for developers. Developers tend to be very good at, at seeing either the big picture and walking down to the low-level details, or seeing the low-level details and walking back up to the big picture. But we are not good, because we're human beings, at going from one directly to the other. This is not something we are, now there are, there are always exceptions to the rule. Given that there are enough people in this room, there are probably one or two of you who are really good. I'm jealous, so fine. You know, but I'm never going to be able to do that. I, can, I understand how to take the big picture. And it doesn't necessarily take me days to walk down to the details, but it takes me a little, I have to sort of work my way through the levels, or I can take the low levels and work my way up. But I can't do both at the same time. And I suspect that many of you also cannot do that. And so if you're interrupted by working at the design or architecture level on one project, by having to fit, do a fix for a customer, recognize that the multitasking, the context switching is going to take you longer, and it's going to, to to cost more. 
Now, one of the things that's on this, that's on this is the idea of unstaffed work on the very bottom. If you can work on one thing during the week and you can only work on one thing during the week, then all those other projects are unstaffed. You can develop a portfolio just like this for, to, to discuss with your manager so that he or she can see why you say that there's unstaffed work. Right? And showing them what it's going to take for you to actually finish stuff can be really helpful. I have a slide a little later on about the time cost of multitasking. So we'll get into that later. <coughs> One of the things you want to do, and, and for those of you who uh, work on several projects as architects, you want to get the highest possible level of project portfolio. And here's an interesting one from one of my clients. You'll notice that in February, which is the shortest month of the year, and that in United, this is a US client, we also have President's Day in February. We couldn't give both Washington and Lincoln their own birthdays. No, we have to have one President's Day. So there's a Monday holiday in here. So instead of 20 working days, we have something like 19. And if you live in the northeast section of the United States like I do, there's usually a vacation week in there because that's the time they give the kids off from school. So everyone with kids is either scrambling to go on vacation or scrambling to find daycare and not working full time anyway. So it's really important to understand that if there are three projects going on in February, you got to wonder if they're all fully staffed. You got to ask that question. If you are one of those people who can, who can put together a month by month list of the kinds of projects you're going to be doing and show your manager and say, you know, we have, if, if this was August, I believe people here in August take a lot of vacation. Yeah, I'm quite jealous of that. Um, if this was August and I supposedly have three projects, we know we're not going to make it, right? I know as a developer it's not going to happen. So I can already look, if by looking at the big picture about projects, I can already see that this is not going to happen. And it's something I want to talk to my manager about. Putting together, the, I happen to use Excel for this. You don't need to use Excel. You can use a list. You can make pictures of a table. You can use stickies on the wall. Um, but anything that allows you to show your manager a picture of the work that you're working on is very, very helpful and really makes a big difference about how you have the conversation. So I was going to ask you how you say no right now. And I would like you to take a couple minutes and talk to each other. Just talk to your neighbors and say, how do you say no? Because I have a bunch of ways that I know how to say no. Take a couple minutes. So what kind of ways do you have to say no? Yes. I'm sorry? Here are the consequences. And if I, if I do this, here are the consequences to the rest of my work. Great one. Others? Yes. So say when. Right? If, I can't do it now. I can't start it now. But I could certainly start it next week or next month sometimes. Why? You have to be a little careful with why. The why questions, because it's otherwise you say, why? Right? The music with that why is a little non-career enhancing. But if you say, tell me more about why you want it, now it's a, it's a conversation as opposed to a... <sighs> slap across the face. So show me the priorities of everything, right? You, you want to give me this one. Let me, let's talk about what else I'm doing to understand the priorities. Others? No, and here's why. Let me explain to you what's going on. So you guys came up with many of the ones that are already on my list. Um, the the gentleman over there said next week, right, which is not right now and off for a date. Um, sometimes I like to say, here's what I can do, right? I can do this, and then I can do this, and then I can do this. So it's, it puts a very positive spin on the fact that I'm actually saying no. Um, one of the ones I actually really like, but you have to be careful with, is here's what I'm doing, what should I stop doing? If you say, here's what I'm doing, what should I stop? That's another non-career enhancing conversation. Um, but if you say, here's what I'm doing, and this goes back to the priorities that someone said over here. Let's, let's talk about what it is I should not be doing. What should I put on my unstaffed work? 
the stuff that I'm actually not going to take care of. Yeah. I actually think that this is one of the things managers get paid to do. <laughs> Uh-oh, was that a non-career enhancing conversation? Um, because I, I, I do. I really agree. I, I agree with you that the manager makes the decision. And I think that that's a good thing. Because, yes, the manager doesn't always know the technical ramifications of that decision, in which case then the gentleman who said here are the consequences, you have to say, we can do that. Right? In fact, one of the things I'm actually very fond of saying is, I can do anything you want, just not all at the same time. So I can do that, and here are the consequences of doing that. Yeah, it's, no, I'll sit with it for a while, see if it fits. It, not all of these are going to fit for everybody. Okay, how many of you are already on multiple projects? Okay, so we should have a little conversation about this. Um, if you, and if you do have that, then having a project portfolio is actually very, very helpful. Because then you can say, here's what I'm doing for project one, here's what I'm doing for project two, here's what I'm doing for project three, here's what I'm doing for project four. And the fact that you are on all those projects means you're not making progress on almost anything. Right? Any, anyone here working on four projects? Actually, anyone here working on three or more projects? Oh, dear. Okay. So, and, and let me guess. I'll just throw out some percentages. One of your managers, you're supposed to work 50% on one of them and 35% on the other and 15% on the last one because it all adds up to 100. Yeah. Um, except the problem is, is that with all the context switching, if you're like me, you might be able to spend a couple days on the 50% one. And you might be able to spend a day or so on the 35% one. But the, all the rest of the time is either wasted in meetings or in context switching, and you never get to the third one. Or what happens is two or three weeks into it, you say, oh, I haven't done anything with the third one. I better go do something about that before I get yelled at by my manager. And so. It's very, very helpful to have a portfolio that says, here's what I'm supposed to be doing at any given time. And if you, I'm going to talk later about working in iterations, because one of the things you can do is work in one week iterations, if necessary, only one day iterations, to make progress on something and not allow interruptions from the other things. So having your manager make the decision if it's, if, it's only, if it's one of three managers, that's a problem. You've got to get them all together and make a decision. But I'm hoping that at some point there's a manager that's responsible for making sure all the work gets done. And if not, then that's something to consider discussing with how you folks already do project management, which is not the topic of this talk, so I'm going to keep going. Um, one of the things that I like sometimes is to explain why the request makes no sense. Um, but you have to be really careful with this. Sometimes you're dealing with somebody's pet project. And if you're dealing with somebody's pet project, this is not a rational, logical conversation. Right? Their emotions are involved. And so if you just appeal to them on the logical level, you're actually not getting through because they have so many emotions involved in this, they probably can't hear you. You also have to be careful not to tell any, actually anybody that their ideas don't make sense. Right? When you tell someone their ideas don't make sense, what they, they don't hear that it's their ideas that don't make sense. They hear that they don't make sense. Right? So they immediately take this as personal feedback, and they no longer hear anything you say about anything. Right? So, because you've just called them, you know, idiots or something. So that's not a very helpful thing to say. So there are a bunch of other possibilities on this list. Uh, one of the ones I also really like is the last one on the bottom, which is offer a date for a date. I know that you want me to do this thing, and I know that I can't do it right now, so let me look at it and tell you when I can start it and when I think I can finish it. And sometimes, just the fact that you're honoring the request is enough information for the manager. Not always, but sometimes that works. So, that, so there's a bunch of things here that I hope you can keep in mind. But it sounds like you also have a bunch of ideas yourselves about how you could say no. 
So I'm talking about having conversations with your manager. And I think the real key is that you have to make sure you have you, you are prepared to have this conversation with your manager. Having the portfolio is really important, but the other part is to build the relationship with the manager. And I know that you guys have been going through a lot of hiring, so if your manager is really busy with the hiring, is your manager paying attention to the people who are still working here? It's, it's really difficult for managers sometimes in fast-growing organizations to be able to deal with this. So one of the things you can do is you can ask to have one-on-ones. Uh, anyone here have one-on-ones with their manager on a regular basis? Uh, so uh, at least a f more than a few, I think. This is really good. Those of you who aren't having regular one-on-ones with your manager, start asking for them. And by regular, I mean every week or every other week for 20 minutes. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It just has to get done. Um, and to make sure that you actually have a personal portfolio, your backlog of work, so that you have a, a place, a context to have the conversation. Now the problem is, even if you do all these things and you figure out how to say no nicely, sometimes it's really difficult to convince management that context switching is a bad idea. And so I have several ideas about how you can try and convince management that context switching is a bad idea. And the first one is to speak management's language. That means you have to know what managers do all day. So think about what happens when you come to work. You come to work, I'll just call it a nine to six day. Right? I don't know what your actual hours are. I think Ed, when you told me you come in really early, I don't know. But let's call nine to six because I can actually do that in my head. So you come in at nine o'clock, you get a cup of coffee, you sit down, you read your email, and by 9.15 or 9.30, you're actually ready to do technical work. Because right? you're a developer. And so, uh, okay, so I'm hoping that you're ready to do technical work that your email doesn't take you three hours to do. So you sit down and you do technical work in chunks, and you probably have most of the morning to get a bunch of work done. Now maybe you have, maybe you get some questions that, where you're interrupted, and maybe you have a meeting in the afternoon or a meeting a couple of mornings a week. So not every day is the same. But you basically have a good-sized chunk in the morning, and then you go to lunch, and you have a good-sized chunk in the afternoon. And in between, you set aside time for keeping up with your email or you check your voicemail. But you, you can get work done in fairly significant chunks of time. Now contrast that with your managers. Or actually, those of you who are senior developers who are also architects, you probably have a day that looks more like this. You get in for 9 o'clock. You quick get a cup of coffee because you have a 9 o'clock meeting. And the 9 o'clock meeting is supposed to end at 9.55, but it goes until 10.05, at which point you are now late for your 10 o'clock meeting. So you run to your 10 o'clock meeting, getting some coffee on the way, hoping that you can plug in your laptop as you get there because you still have not not checked your email and you don't know what's going on. Your voicemail, your phone has gone to voicemail, and you can hear it vibrate several times in your pocket. But you can't take the time to check it because this particular meeting you can't do. So now you get out of your 10 o'clock meeting at 11. You have an 11.30 appointment with someone, so you have all of half an hour to check your voicemail and to check your email. So you don't get all the way through your email. You might not get all the way through your voicemail. And now you have that 11.30 meeting with the very important somebody, and you, it, goes, it actually goes from 11.30 until 2, and you're going to have lunch during it. So you go to the cafeteria, you get some stuff. You see some people. In fact, one of your developers has actually come to you and said, I got a question for you. But you can't tell him anything yet because you've been in meetings all day. You finally end up with this very important customer at 1.30 or this very important someone at 1.30. And you get back to your office because you have another half hour until 2. By this time, you have another 100 email messages, and another five voicemails. You are behind. And it goes like this until six. And so as a manager, you then take your laptop home because now you're going to try and do your email at night, return all your voicemail phone calls. That's the life of a manager. I certainly hope that's not your lives as developers. I really hope it's not that. Because I don't see how you get anything done if it is. So. When you speak management's language, you've got to understand that their day, first of all, is completely different than your day. I mean, on a bad developer day, you might only have an hour chunk in the morning and an hour or two hour chunk in the afternoon because you've got meetings and you've got other stuff going on.
But by and large, you have at least that much chunking time to get work done. Your managers don't have that much time. And because they don't have that much time, all they do is context switch. That's all they do every day, every single day that they come to work. And so if they ever get more than half an hour in their office, they don't actually know what to do with it. Right? They're sitting there saying, gee, I know that there's something I should do. I wonder what the heck it is. So, I mean, it's really hard. I, I actually ran into this. I was working as the director of engineering for a voicemail company um, back in the early 90s. And I was checking my voicemail at 1130 at night. I was already in bed. My husband was brushing his teeth. And he came out of the bathroom and he said, Johanna, what are you doing? And I said, I'm checking voicemail. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm on the phone. It's 1130 at night. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm checking voicemail. You didn't hear me the first time? He said, no, Johanna, listen to yourself. Are you actually making good decisions at 1130 at night? Oh, that's a good question. If your managers are like that, if they have to resort to checking email and voicemail after hours and late at night, they are not making good decisions. They are not even thinking about the ramifications of these decisions. So they're multitasking. Sometimes they're not making good decisions. And what you have to do is figure out a way to sort of enter their context and speak their language and say, I understand that you want this. And here are the consequences if we get it, if I, if I start doing it. So the first part is to really be able to speak their language. The second part is to be able to show them some pictures. And I actually have these pictures because I, I developed these for my book because I said, you know, there are, there are going to be project managers who don't believe me when I explain about the context switching. And this particular picture is something you can use, right? So you say, okay, if I do task one and it takes me a week to do, and I do task two, and it takes me a week to do. Then at the end of week one, I have a finished task. At the end of week two, I have a finished task, a task. But if I start context switching, here's what happens. And this is, um, this is assuming that, say, Monday I do task one, Tuesday I do task two. Monday I do task one, Thursday, oh, okay. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? You do it, because I'm not going to be able to say it right. I'm going to screw it up. But, and so the first time you get anything done, you, you get the, the project one ends somewhere around the end of week two. So instead of, let me go back, instead of having the first thing end at the end of the first week, the first thing doesn't end until around the end of the second week. All of this time in here is spent context switching. If you show your manager this picture, and your manager thinks about the kind of days that he or she has at the office, your manager will believe this, right? That's the thing, because this is the picture of his or her day, especially when they go from meeting to meeting to meeting and have to try and remember what the heck they were talking about in this meeting so they can bring it to that meeting, right? They will, re they will recognize this. This is what happens to them all day. So you can use these pictures along with your personal backlog to say, how am I going to deal with my manager? How am I going to talk to my manager about this? How am I going to make it worthwhile to talk about it? Now, I think one of the other things you can do is really think about how to use approaches that, to be honest, your manager doesn't have to know about. OK? I am not saying that your managers are stupid. I am saying that sometimes telling your managers everything that you do and the way you do it doesn't help you. It's really not about the managers. It's not. Um, one of the things you want to do is say, can I chunk up any work so I don't have to try and context switch between multiple projects in one day? Now, every time you try and context switch between multiple projects in one day, you lose that concentrated chunk of time. So remember I said, I mean, the best amount of time you can get done in a day is six hours. You can get six hours of technical work done in a day. You still have some meetings to go to. You still have some email. You still have questions to answer for people. So you can't even think that you can get eight hours of technical work done in a day. Six is the maximum. And I have some clients who get closer to three. Right? That's, that's as much technical work as they can get done in a day. 
So if you, if you know that you're not going to get all that much technical work done in a day, you can say at least I'll chunk by day. Chunking work by day, being able to work for an entire day on one particular project, allows you to finish something. And if you do the kinds of things that I like to do, like test-driven development and implementing by feature, then you actually can see progress, which is one of the reasons people ask you to multitask. So anyone here using test-driven development or implementing by feature? Yes. OK. We're infecting the world. So I know that was, I'm, I, I, I keep thinking if I can just get the test-driven development virus to infect all software developers, life will be wonderful. OK, it might take a few more things, but you know that would be helpful. So I think the key is you can do one-day iterations, especially if you can show progress at the end of the day. Even better than one-day iterations are one-week iterations. And some of you are probably saying, you know, Johanna, you are smoking something if you think we can get anything done here in a week. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there are ways to break down those big three, four, five, and six week chunks of work into much smaller pieces. Are you guys familiar with the concept of user stories or inch pebbles? User stories? OK. So you already know about small pieces of work. For those of you who don't know about user stories, user stories are a piece of functionality that deliver value to the project. It can be a very small piece of functionality. But the nice thing about user stories is that they allow you to finish something in a day or so. The same thing you can do now, if, you, if you're having trouble organizing by user stories and, and your project doesn't want you to do that, you can use the same idea with, the, with something called inch pebbles. You know about milestones? Inch pebbles, right? One or two day tasks that are either done or not done. I thought I was so smart I made it up. I didn't. Right. It's been around for probably as long as other people have been writing about project management. So the idea behind inch pebbles and user stories is that it allows you to set up a rhythm for the work that you do. And I suspect many of you have noticed that some of your projects don't seem to have a rhythm at all. They feel very chaotic, like you can't get anything done. You're slogging through quicksand. You just, you just can't get anything done on them. And some projects feel as if, we're making progress. It's slow, but we're making progress. The projects that are making progress have a, a sort of a drum beat, a rhythm to them. And that means that people are either using something like user stories or inch pebbles so that they are delivering something of value every other day or every day into the code base, into the project, so other people can see the progress. So the kinds of approaches that you use don't have to be something that your project managers have to necessarily know about, although I think it's very helpful for them if they know about it, you can do this all by yourself. If you have a three-week task in your project, you break it up so that there's always something that you deliver every day or so. And if you're working with user stories, it's even better. So the key here is you, you get to say, how can I do things in chunks? How can I make sure that I use all six hours of technical work in a given day so I actually can make progress? At, because the more progress I can make, the easier, the easier it's going to be for me to take on more work that my manager wants me to do. And I suspect all of you have that problem, which is why you're here. So think about chunking in iterations. And your iterations can be very short. They do not have to be four weeks long. They could be only one day, although it's really hard to reliably make progress every single day. Certainly one week. I am sure that you all could do some kind of work where you iterate and get valuable results at the end of a week. And then even if you have to say, I'll work on this project this week and this project this week, and even if you have four or five projects, OK, it's one week per project, you have a lot of context switching to get back to that first project, but you, you didn't leave anything hanging. Right? You left things in a state where they were done. And that helps a lot with the context switching. It helps you figure out where you were so you can get back to it. One of the other things I like to think about with chunking is to make sure that we've estimated well so that we actually know when it is we're going to be done with certain things. 
So those of you who know about user stories and iterations and test-driven development, you probably already know about separating sizing from duration, right? So one of the things, we are really good as humans as thinking about things that are small, medium, and large. We can do that really well. But we're not good at how small, how medium, and how large. That part we're not very good at. So if you separate the sizing from duration, and again, I happen to really like Mike Cohn's Fibonacci series. When you estimate, you estimate in, in just a, a number, which is supposedly story points, which the Fibonacci series is 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. And then I just go 40, 60, 80, 100. I know it's pretty sad for public arithmetic when you can't remember what 13 and 8 is. I know, but life is tough. So, and yes, I do actually have a degree in computer science, but I can't do math. It's okay. So, it's arithmetic. Who needs to do arithmetic? So the key here is you estimate in something that helps you decide how big is, is this thing. Is it really small? Is it sort of small? Is it sort of medium? Is it really big? If it's, if it's 40, 60, 80, or 100, we have no clue. We actually don't know how big it is. We just know relative to the biggest thing we understand, a 21, it's double that, or four times it, or five times it. But we really don't know, which is a clue that says we have to somehow break that apart into smaller pieces so we can understand how to estimate what it's going to be. And if you also then estimate in person, in, uh, in, um, person hours, not person days, you never fall into the trap of eight person hours equals a day. So, uh, one of the things I did uh, for a client, I was working with them on their schedule at the beginning of the project. And I said, you know, the schedule just feels really optimistic. I'm not quite, I don't have my finger on why. But if I look at your previous schedule, it looks like, you know, you can, it's hard for me to believe you can get that much stuff done in this amount of time. I said, how did you estimate? And they said, we used ideal person hours. And I said, okay, how'd you do it? And they said, well, eight person hours is a person day. And I said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not eight, it's less. You know, let's, let's just, if we, if we increase, if we just assume that there's six person hours in a person day, what does your schedule look like? And it started to look a lot more reasonable. That particular organization was really focused and really productive, but they made this one little mistake with their estimates and their schedules were all off. So that's one of the ways you can really think about working with your project managers and saying, let's figure out how to do this piece. Um, one of the things I really like is to build a personal product backlog. Remember I talked about the project portfolio before. If you have your list of things that you have to do, and let me, you can show, I can show you my list, which you won't be able to see. I have stickies on my computer, and because I'm traveling, I want to make sure that I see this all the time. So I have, you can see there's all these little lists, this little list of things that's in rough, rough priority order. On my to-do list, I actually have it numbered because I'm, I guess the best word is anal about this. Um, and you don't have to number them, but you have to have your little list of all the stuff you got to do. I get great pleasure out of crossing things off my list. I don't know about the rest of you. Anyone else here a list maker who loves to cross things off? <sighs> Isn't it? Okay, and the rest of you who don't like to make lists, okay. I believe that you're great workers and I don't know how you do it. But um, however you do it, having your personal backlog of the stuff you need to get done. And the other thing I actually do is I have a, a weekly list of all the stuff I have to do for the week. And then I have my Monday list. And then I, in effect, I reconstitute it for Tuesday because I'm optimistic too. I keep thinking I can finish that article or finish that chapter on Monday and then it doesn't happen and it has to go to Tuesday. So what am I going to take off my Tuesday list? So it's okay to reconstitute your daily list out of your weekly list. It makes a lot of sense actually. So you can organize your work in a way that allows you to make as much progress as you can on any one given project and know where all the other to-dos are. Right? It's not a surprise to you. It's, you're not 
surprised by work that just pops up. Now, if your manager pops into your office and says, you know, I'd like you to do one more thing, yeah, that's a surprise. But if organizing your work in certain ways and, and trying to do them in small chunks allows you to really see where you are. Now, I don't know how, uh, do I have any testers in the room? No. Uh, oh, yes, I see a couple hands. One of the things that's a really powerful technique, especially if your managers want you to do several projects at one time, is to integrate testing with development. And there's a whole, le there's a whole way of integrating testing. So I think test-driven development, first of all, is the, is the easiest, best, and cheapest way of integrating testing with development. Um, anytime you can build automated tests to run regression against your stuff to make sh and to make sure you have a smoke test for the build, all that stuff. It's also fabulous if you can sit with your testers. If you have testers that can sit with you as developers and talk to you about what's going on, why are you guys laughing? Is, you tried this, it's not working, or they won't let you? No? It's depends on the So we, we write code that does ingestion. Great. I think most of the people are testers and developers. Oh, that's really wonderful. So if you, do you also have system level testers that test after you're done? So bringing some of those people into the development team um, so that they can look at the, at the testing from a system level is also a part of integrating testing with development. So it sounds like you're already doing a part of this, which is really great. Do you also do reviews of some sort? Do you do, yeah? Do you, what kind of reviews do you do? Do you do formal inspections? Kind of, kind of inspections. So the interesting, do you have reader reviewers and people have to prepare for a couple days in advance? There's another lighter weight technique that doesn't help um, too many other people. Under, one of the nice benefits of formal inspections is that lots of people learn that area of the code base, which is a really nice side effect. But it's a heavyweight technique, and if you're, it also causes context switching because now you're working on having to read someone else's code while you're trying to finish your stuff. There's a technique that I've been using that's a, a kind of peer review that I call buddy review, where I write code for a couple hours and you'll write code for a couple hours. You know, not very much time. We exchange it, we review it, we look at it, we give each other feedback, and then we go off to lunch. And then I might write code for a couple hours in the afternoon, and Edwin will write code for a couple of hours in the afternoon. And then we'll exchange that, we'll read it, give each other review comments, and you know maybe take a coffee break. And then I'll do it again. So the nice thing about that is that especially if you change with whom you review on a regular basis, you can get a lot of different peer review from a lot of different people, and it doesn't cost as much as a formal inspection. Now, I don't know if you guys are you know, CMM something or SEI, you know. It, so I'm not trying to tell you to do something that's not in your defined process, right? So if you have a defined process, keep doing it. But if you have options or if you find that your more formal inspections aren't occurring when you want them to, try a little bit of buddy review in between the formal inspections. Because the nice thing is because it's not very long, it doesn't take very long to review, right? You, I mean, I don't know how much code you guys can write in a couple hours, but not that much, All right? It's just not possible. All right, so where am I? So one of the things that, that it's really important, if you want to be able to take on more work, you gotta, you gotta have some guidelines. You have to know, is this work strategically important for you and for the organization? I suspect that sometimes when you have projects that people want you to do, it's actually not strategically important, right? And strategically important might mean that you work on the first project that has the first deadline, and you get that one done. And then you work on the project with the next deadline, and you get that one done. Sometimes strategically important work is work that allows you to go faster on projects. So if you don't already have a unit testing framework for your projects, spending a few days or a week organizing the unit testing framework so everyone else can make a lot more progress, that's strategically important work. 